The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, Secrets of the Zero's Design, Tactics and Strategy, SPGs of Different Nations, and How to Play Them, and Metal Beasts, the Premium French Super Vehicle. AMX-30 Super is a premium French MBT sitting at BR 8.7, a highly versatile vehicle that has enough firepower to deal with tanks of different generations and enough mobility to let you be really flexible with your playstyle. The tank is armed with a 105mm gun that comes with a two-plane stabilizer. It elevates from minus 8 degrees to 20 degrees and reloads in 6.7 seconds with a maxed-out crew. Furthermore, you have two machine guns at your disposal. One, a freely rotating one on the top of the turret, and a second, coaxial one, on the main turret. There are also 16 smoke grenade launchers scattered all around your turret. The frontal armor comes in the form of 50mm and 79mm thick plates on the upper glacy plate angled at almost 70 degrees. The lower glacy is also 79 millimeters thick, but is sloped at a less favorable angle. The mantlet is between 50 and 80 millimeters thick, and you don't get more than 30 to 40 millimeters of armor in other places. The transmission and the engine are located in the rear. First order ammo is stored in the rear part of the turret. The rest of your ammunition is stored in the hull, to the right of your driver. The three other members of the crew are sitting in the turret. Now, a few words about its ammo. You have access to four rounds. A heat, an HE, a smoke, and an APFSDS round. Every single one of them has its uses, but the most common pick at this rank is obviously the last one. It pierces 350 millimeters of steel at 500 meters, allowing the AMX-30 to keep up with not only its direct rivals, but also many more advanced MBTs. The best thing about this tank is its superior firepower. You get an excellent gun, powerful rounds, a two-plane stabilizer, good optics, and a laser rangefinder. All of that combined allows for some precise, comfortable, and effective shooting. At the same time, you should avoid getting hit at all costs. Even your front can't really take a beating, with bounces being your only hope. Not to mention that the Commander's Coppola is a shell magnet and also makes it tricky to hide the vehicle behind natural cover. The best way to play the AMX-30 would be familiar to anyone mimicking almost any of the Western-type MBTs. It can be a very effective sniper at long range thanks to its APF-SDS rounds good elevation angles, and the capability of rapid repositioning, while a stabilizer and a decent traverse speed help it to stand its ground in CQC. Tanking shots is probably not an option, but you have every tool at your disposal to be the one that shoots first. To maximize your chances of survival, we suggest that you take no more than 20 tank rounds, 25 if you absolutely need to. This way, most of your ammo will be stored in the turret and not in the hull, thereby greatly reducing the risk of getting one-shotted. The more time you stay in battle, the more frags you'll be able to get for the glory of your team. All World War II-era aircraft buffs know this story. In 1937, the Japanese Navy issued specifications for a new fighter meant to replace the A-5M, shocking everyone involved in the Japanese aviation industry. The requirements were so high that, at some point, they seemed impossible to meet. Not surprisingly, manufacturers were in no haste to take the job. 
Only Mitsubishi felt like they were up to the challenge. They had the legendary Horikoshi Jiro, after all, and the famous engineer was happy to tackle a new, impossible task to design and build the aircraft that we know as the Zero. It is also widely known that at first, this fighter seemed almost undefeatable. It could cross thousands of kilometers to suddenly strike its enemies, leaving them no chance to fight back or to escape. But how did Horikoshi manage to achieve that? Maybe he had access to some advanced technologies that other nations had no clue of? Or maybe he was so great an engineer that even some of the universal laws of physics bent to his will? No, there was a completely different reason for the success of the Zero, or a number of them. First, in order to make the aircraft as light as possible, the engineering team got rid of almost everything, leaving the aircraft with the bare minimum. No armor, no protection for fuel tanks, and that wasn't all. You're probably aware that almost all production aircraft are made in a way that you basically assemble them from parts that are produced separately. This also makes them easy to disassemble for major repairs or transportation. Take the American P-51 Mustang or the Soviet Yak, for instance. Their wings were produced separately and then were bolted to the fuselage. The wing design of the BF-109 relied on the use of root ribs. The Italian Macchi C202 utilized a structural arrangement where the center wing section was an integral part of the fuselage, but you still had to attach outer wings to it. The problem with this approach is that all those places where different parts are fastened to each other are also the aircraft's weak points. That's exactly where the aircraft will start breaking apart under pressure. To compensate for that, assembly joints were made extra sturdy, with parts that are forged in one piece and often steel ones to boot. <laughs> Imagine all that weight. With that in mind, the most radical thing about the Zero was that there were no assembly points whatsoever. The whole aircraft was made in one piece. Well, you could actually detach the tail section. But that was just yet another trick to make the plane even lighter. Everything was designed to get maximum durability with the least possible weight. All of that readily producible, even though the assembly of a single Zero took roughly five times more man-hours than the one of the Germans BF-109, the most produced piston single-engine fighter in history. On the other hand, this kind of design made Zeros a nightmare to repair. Every single zero was like a very intricate piece of jewelry. Even a single scratch could ruin it all. You couldn't even use the wing to climb to the cockpit. There were special retractable steps for that, lest you wanted to damage the delicate skin of the aircraft. This wasn't a plane for any pilot or any mechanic. This was a work of art, meant to be used only by the true masters of the craft. Self-propelled guns, or SPGs, were initially used against enemy fortifications, but every nation presented in the game had its own vision when it came to their design. As a result, even though in theory SPGs of different countries belong to the same class, they often play very differently. Very differently! Let's take a look at a few well-known tank destroyers of different nations and discuss the ways they should be played to get the most out of them. Let's start with Germany and its glorious Brumba, an SPG found at BR 4.7 and is armed with a powerful 15 cm howitzer. The first thing to take into account is the very low velocity of your rounds. Basically, because of this, you're most effective when engaging enemies up close, when you simply cannot miss. Your front can take a lot of punishment, but it has its share of weak points. What does that mean to us gameplay-wise? It's not a good idea to go solo at the very start of the match. 
stick to the team. This way, you will have someone to cover you while you're reloading. Also, don't forget to make full use of your high caliber. When engaging a particularly sturdy tank, or simply any vehicle hiding behind good cover, shoot at the ground right next to it. A 15 cm HE round is no joke. It's often enough to seriously damage or even destroy the opponent's vehicle. Next up is the T-95, an American tank destroyer with a BR of 7.0. Only a heat round or a handful of specific sub-caliber rounds can pierce its 300mm thick frontal armor, while its own 105mm gun easily punches through almost 250 millimeters of steel with an APCBC. With such armor and firepower, there should be a catch of some sorts, right? Well, this TD is painfully slow. Its max speed is 12 kph. When using a T95, you have to plan your route in advance, or you might get to your first good position only by the end of the match. You'll also benefit from having teammates around. They will deal with the more agile tanks that might be a real threat in the one-on-one -on -one scenario. And keep in mind that in your situation, more agile tanks means almost all tanks there are. Not all tank destroyers have great armor, though. Take a gander at the British FV-4005. Its turret is protected by only 14 millimeters of armor and that's at BR 6.7. Its redeeming feature is its massive 183mm gun. That's the biggest tank caliber in the game, by the way. You should definitely capitalize on that. Keep your distance. Never engage your enemies face to face. Not to mention that in the long distance engagements, you won't be at a big disadvantage due to your slow reload. It takes the gun almost 30 seconds to shoot again, after all. Finally, let's take a look at the AMX-50 Fourche, a French tank destroyer sitting at BR 7.3. It breaks yet another unspoken rule of SPG do Oh, meh, it goes fast. On a good road, it can achieve a speed of up to 50 kph, meaning that it has enough mobility to quickly change positions or to mount flanking maneuvers. At the same time, your 180mm thick UFP gives you sufficient protection against kinetic projectiles so that you should feel safe even when leading the charge. It's never a good idea to rush into a potential kill zone, though. This vehicle has a max speed of 5 kph when going in reverse, which means that any unfavorable encounter might easily become <laughs> your last one. Stick to your allies. They will have your back at a pinch. That's basically all there is to it. SPGs might be very fast or infuriatingly slow, well protected, or have no protection at all. But there is something that all SPGs of different nations have in common. They all have a monster of a gun. <laughs> have fun with it. Next up is the last section of our show, where we answer your questions from the comments section. The first question was sent by Gus Gelens. A triathlon for twin engine fighters, please. Hi. Sounds like a brilliant idea. Will do. Keep your eyes peeled. Alexander Novakovic asks, Why doesn't every plane have combat flaps in the game? Sometimes they only have landing and takeoff flaps that cannot be used at any time. Good day, Alexander. The answer is simple. It's because not all aircraft had flap configurations that could be used in combat. If we get more technical, flap control systems come in three different types. They can be hydraulic, electric, or pneumatic. The first two types allow for a lot of different positions and configurations, including the capability of extending flaps at a certain angle and to locking them in that position. On the other hand, both hydraulic and electric systems are typically heavy 
and large, especially if we're talking about systems that we used 70 years ago. Pneumatic systems are lighter, but can only go in two preset positions, as the air pressure is either there or not. That's why with this system in place, flaps can only go either up or down. These kinds of systems were used on Spitfires and Soviet Yaks, for instance. Then there is a question sent by Andreina Martinez. What is the little flap in the front of the BMP-1 that opens in the water? Thanks for an interesting question. We always get very excited when fans of the game notice the smallest of details. This is a so-called water deflection shield. When the vehicle moves across water obstacles, it might take on water when crashing into waves. This flap is used to prevent that by creating a wave that helps to keep the nose of the vehicle above water so that it doesn't, well, take on water. Daniel Tsiobanu asks, how much explosive is needed to cut off a plane's wing? That depends. If we're talking about a direct hit, then not much, just a few dozen grams. You can actually rip the wing off with a good burst of AP rounds, involving no explosives whatsoever. At the same time, proper HE rounds, rockets or flak rounds can easily tear the whole aircraft apart. If we're talking about a bomber that might get damaged by its own bombs, then it's not just the explosive mass that matters, but also the altitude you're flying at. For instance, you might easily lose your wings by dropping a 250 kilogram bomb without a delay at 100 meters. The last message was sent by a user called Random German Soldier. Will you make pages of history about Gulf War? Vietnam War or other war after World War II? We can't promise that, but we will certainly consider doing this. Thanks for the idea. That's it for today. You're still watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. Now I instruct you to subscribe, <laughs> because I want to. Then you must press that bell. That's because I'm telling you to. And finally, because it's me narrating, leave a like because you do. Finally, please tell us what you think in the comments below. Thanks everyone. See you in a week.